Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this edition of Defense News Weekly, we'll find out just how much money the Navy wants to cut to fund the future fleet, get an update on nuclear modernization, and we'll look at how the Air Force wants to protect bases in the Pacific. With in-depth interviews, up-close video, and leading analysis, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome to this week's edition of Defense News Weekly. I'm July Toro, and for Jeff Martin, who's on assignment in Florida, we've got a busy show this week, and we'll go in depth on a few issues like nuclear modernization and the need to protect bases in the Pacific. But before we do that, here's a look at some headlines. Up first, some big news this week as President Trump effectively fired the Pentagon's policy chief, Under Secretary John Rood, who submitted his resignation upon the president's request. Rood, who was central to the withholding and resumption of military aid to Ukraine, had also been criticized for his management style within the department. And at this point, it's unclear whether he was fired for that or his role with the Ukraine aid. He'll be replaced by an acting official, leaving yet another critical Pentagon job in the hands of a temporary caretaker. And the Navy is looking to slash $40 billion over the next five years in order to increase their investment in the fleet of the future. The drive to do this is coming from Acting Secretary Thomas Modley, who wants to squeeze out the funds needed to grow the Navy. It's part of a military-wide trend known as night courts, where the services take a fine-tooth comb through their budgets to eke out savings. The Air Force's new MH-139 Gray Wolf support helicopter has begun flight testing, and initial groundwork is expected to be done by the end of the month. The work is being done at Eglin's Duke Field, and all tests should be finished by 2022. The Air Force plans to buy 84 helicopters to use for missile field support and airlift. They'll replace aging UH-1 Hueys that have been difficult to maintain in recent years. And Singapore's Air Chief says the Asian nation's first upgraded F-16 should be ready next year and that work will be done locally by ST Engineering. The work would upgrade the F-16's radar, computers, and avionics, along with integrating new weapons. Singapore has 60 F-16s spread between three squadrons in Singapore and a training unit in the United States. And construction issues have caused major delays in establishing the new Aegis Ashore Missile Defense Site in Poland, according to the Missile Defense Agency's director. In fact, the delays mean the site likely won't be ready in 2022, more than four years from when it was supposed to be ready. But the director, Vice Admiral John Hill, says the schedule is a worst case scenario and that construction could get back on track for an earlier operational date. The Polish site would complement the existing site in Romania. Collins Aerospace and Lockheed Martin say they've wrapped up work to enhance the U-2's imaging capability, deploying a new electro-optical recon system on the venerable aircraft. The upgrade allows the U-2 to provide better ISR coverage, as well as increasing the accuracy of long-range tracking. This is especially critical as the Air Force appears to be planning to keep those U-2s around for at least the next five years. European nations are spending more on defense as doubts continue to circulate over America's commitment to defending Europe. According to a study from the International Institute for Strategic Studies, European defense spending increased 4.2 percent from 2018 to 2019 at the same time that global defense spending has risen. The study comes as many nations are continually worried about Russian aggression on NATO's eastern flank. In this week's Pentagon briefing, there were two major issues that came up, the firing of policy chief John Rood and the decision to reprogram billions of acquisition dollars to pay for a border wall. Here's how Pentagon officials defended those decisions. Rood resignation. Um, in his letter of resignation, he said that the Secretary Esper had told him that pr the president uh, was seeking his removal. Um, did Secretary Esper request of the president that um, Secretary Rood be removed. And then I have another question. Um, there are some people who are making the link that because of Mr. Rood's role in the certification letter for the Ukraine aid, that there's a tie-in to his departure pegged to that. 
Uh, so I'm just going to refer you back to John Rood's letter, uh, resignation letter for, uh, I believe it speaks for itself on the process that uh, that um, uh, went underway uh, that resulted in his uh, submitting that letter. Uh, and I think in his letter he refers to uh, a request from the president through the secretary to him, um, as is the president's prerogative with regard to any political appointee uh, in the administration. Um, uh, the second part of your question is, uh, that sounds speculative to me, I, I have no information that would would lead me to, to that conclusion. So did the secretary recommend to the president that Mr. Baruit be removed? Uh, I have not asked the secretary that question, so I do not know an answer to that. But I would think the letter speaks for itself. On the reprogramming request for the wall, mm -hmm. can you give a sense of the criteria used to pick some of the projects that are obviously angering a lot of members? Like the F-35, the Pentagon's number one program, why did you uh, take a shot at that and move money? So I, I think when you look back to the, the request, so uh, based on the, the fact that there's a national emergency that the president declared last February on the southwest border, we were asked to reprioritize some of our, our funding uh, priorities. Uh, one of those in particular ways in that we looked at this with the 284 funds was let's identify projects that either we have an ex excess need or we have a, uh, um, a, a an untimely need. So that is either things where Congress has funded us for more of what we asked for or things where Congress has funded us before we are ready to purchase or move forward. So an example of that would be, uh, the first one would be aircraft, um, more aircraft than we'd requested, uh, and the second one would be shipbuilding. So uh, we were funded to, uh, to complete construction on an additional ship, um, uh, and we don't have the capacity, the shipbuilding capacity, the contracting to do that for a few more years. And so uh, we still intend uh, in, I think, 2023 to continue with that shipbuilding, but the funds um, the funds were better used for a different purpose now than to be sitting there for the next two years. And follow up, in the 100% in the, uh, certainty that the House Armed Services Committee will reject the reprogramming, what, are, what is your backup plan? Are there other sources of funding well, you're gonna go for? I would say that the reprogram has taken, has taken place. Um, so this is a long-standing authority that the department has had uh, as the ability to reprogram funds within uh, different uh, uh, buckets of money to meet um, uh, new priorities uh, and to counter emergencies. And so that, that reprogram has taken place. That took place last week when the paperwork was signed. Um, uh, the funds haven't been spent yet, um, but, uh, but that has happened already. The Munich Security Conference recently wrapped up in Germany, and one keynote speaker was Defense Secretary Mark Esper. In his remarks, he talked about the rising threat of China and their aggression worldwide. Here's part of that speech. This September will mark the 75th commemoration of the end of World War II and the birth of the international rules-based order that has supported security and prosperity around the globe. The United States, our NATO allies, and partners across the Indo-Pacific have sacrificed blood and treasure over the decades to protect and preserve it. Yet the PRC seeks to undermine and subvert the system the same one that allowed them to rise and become what they are today. As we speak, Communist China is exerting financial and political pressure publicly and privately on many Indo-Pacific and European nations, large and small, while pursuing new strategic relationships worldwide. In fact, the smaller the country, the heavier the hand of Beijing. Through its Belt and Road Initiative, for example, the PRC is leveraging its overseas investments to force other nations into suboptimal security decisions. This has wide-reaching wide ramifications for the United States and our allies in critical areas like data security, interoperability, and military readiness. While we often doubt the transparency and forthrightness of Beijing, when it comes to their security aims, we should take the Chinese government at their word. They have said that by 2035, the PRC intends to complete its military modernization and by 2049, it seeks to dominate Asia as the preeminent global military power. Furthermore, the global community should be deeply concerned about the party's use of artificial intelligence and other technologies to surveil and repress Muslim minorities, journalists, pro-democracy protesters, and others. To make matters worse, the government is now exporting those tools worldwide in a manner that could bolster other authoritarian regimes. China's rapid ascent has stirred much debate over the primacy of the United States and the West in the 21st century. I understand this topic is part of this year's Munich Security Conference report. China's growth over the years has been remarkable, remarkable but in many ways it is fueled by theft and coercion, 
and exploitation of free market economies, private companies, and colleges and universities. American and European institutions and corporations face the brunt of these malign activities, and we have often seen a multitude of examples where our economies and our companies have suffered as a result. But Beijing's behavior, bad behavior, will only take them so far. The world is increasingly aware of its motives and responding in turn. Regrettably, rather than change course, party leadership continues its rampant technology theft while resolving to eventually end its reliance on foreign innovation altogether, then independently develop its own systems, and then dominate critical sectors and markets. Huawei and 5G are today's poster child for this nefarious strategy. History has proven time and again, though, that authoritarianism breeds corruption, promotes conformity, smothers free thinking, and suppresses freedom. In stark contrast to this are our values, sense of fairness and a culture of opportunity where, which encourages disruption and unleashes the very best of human intellect, spirit, and innovation. This is why it is critical that together we, all of us, directly and unambiguously address Beijing's actions and intentions so that we are never intimidated or duped or pushed into bad security, economic, or political choices. And maybe, just maybe, we can get them on the right path. To keep up to date with all of our coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn pages. Also, be sure to add us on Apple's News app and other platforms for the latest updates. When we come back, we'll look at how the Air Force can protect bases in the Pacific and get an update on nuclear modernization. Recently, the new commander of U.S. Strategic Command, Admiral Charles Richard, testified to the Senate Armed Services Committee for the command's annual posture hearing. Here's some highlights from that testimony as he provided an update on nuclear modernization. Earlier this week, a New York Times column summed up the budget's investment in nuclear modernization by saying, quote, the president's spending proposal requests money for a new arms race with Russia and with China and restores nuclear weapons as central to military policy, end quote. The truth is actually the opposite of that. There's no policy change, as you stated, that relates to nuclear weapons in this budget, and it is Russia and China that are expanding their arsenals Why we are not. Is that correct? Senator, to, to, uh, I must confess the whole concept that we're starting an arms race baffles me. Uh, in terms of no nation has done more than the United States to reduce the reliance on nuclear weapons. No nation has divested more nuclear weapons than the United States has. We have waited 15 years in some cases to the absolute limits of what our systems will go before we simply sought to replace like for like inside our triad. So I don't understand where the concept of an arms race comes in, and you're absolutely correct, ma'am. But in terms of sustainment of Minuteman Three, I, um, I, I'm not sure that it is often recognized the extraordinary, extraordinary levels the Air Force went to to be able to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Unlike a submarine, which is designed to have depot level maintenance in it, the Minuteman Three was not. It was designed to serve for a certain period of time and get replaced. And the Air Force went in after the fact and figured out how to take that and get a depot maintenance um, capability retrofitted into the weapon system that will then enable it to go till the crossover point. I think it's a great credit to the Air Force they were able to accomplish that, and that's what gives me confidence, provided no further delay in GBSD, that um, this will work. Uh, let me ask you about the Air Force's budget request and the uh, funding cuts for the B-2 defense management system. Does that decision cause you any concern about the B-2's ability to operate in high-end threat environments to the end of its service life? Senator, I think that is a great example of some of the difficult decisions that we're going to have to make in trading or balancing near-term risk for long-term risk. And so overall, the Air Force is way ahead uh, on the bomber program, bomber roadmap I think it's referred to. I endorse, I think that is a very thoughtful approach uh, in uh, the uh, loss of the defensive management system, we will accommodate that risk uh, for the greater gain the Air Force is going to provide overall. That sounds like a yes to me. That you think that there is a a, a risk that uh, uh, that it, it will uh, there will be some detriment to its ability to operate in high end capacity. There is, but I can manage it. Uh, what else do we need to ensure that the B two maintains its ability to operate in those environments if this decision goes forward? 
Uh, that is uh, part of the planning that I have to do. So we will use operational mechanisms to compensate for uh, technological uh, abilities of the aircraft. I, I retain full confidence that the B-2 can do the missions that I'll ask it to do. Uh, I want to ask about uh, hypersonic missiles, uh, which in your testimony you say, quote, ensure our deterrence and conventional power remains strong in the future. Are you satisfied with the investment that we're making in hypersonic missiles, given the Russians and the Chinese investing so heavily in them? And that can be a question for both of you. Well, Senator, what I will start with, because there's two ways to answer, there's two aspects to your question. One is offensive use of hypersonics by us, and plus there is a defensive piece. And uh, I remind everybody, the, the Russians have publicly reported that they have hypersonics on, on alert now. Um, and so this is a very real thing. My command has had a long-standing requirement for conventional prompt strike that hypersonic technologies uh, would be an ideal way to go accomplish that. And I think that enables me to better deter threats to this nation. And so uh, also, I have responsibility for global strike already uh, inside the uh, Department of Defense. And I think we would be an ideal command because we have concepts, command and control, uh, ready to go to use that to best advantage. Are you, are you satisfied, though, that we're investing sufficiently in all of the aspects of hypersonics, both offensive yeah, and Senator, I am. I was actually very pleased in the priority. Uh, it's in, uh, in line with the national defense strategy in terms of the priority that this budget submission puts in that and a couple of other technical areas. Are you concerned about a developing potential arms race in hypersonics? Um, Senator, no. Again, uh, it is, do you have sufficient capability technologies to meet our national objectives? Uh, and I think we're on pace to do that. One thing the Air Force is focusing on in the Pacific is how to protect valuable aircraft and air bases. During a recent roundtable at the Singapore Air Show, Pacific Air Force's Commander Charles Brown laid out where he stands on the problem and what he wants to use to protect those assets. Because there's not enough Patriot fat. You know, by the way, Patriot fat takes a lot of C-17 yeah. loads. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking for things that are uh, lighter, leaner. Um, you have a uh, more unlimited magazine. Uh, and uh, the cost curve is different. You know, you're, you're very expensive interceptor against a ballistic or cruise missile or hypersonic missile. At, at some point, you know, you, we can't afford it. And so having a high power microwave directed energy gives me a little, gives us a little more flexibility to go different locations, particularly if it's smaller. Um, and that, that's the thought process. I think there's good dialogue about it. Uh, we still have a ways to go. Um, and, and that's why I'm more interested in that than I am on putting it on, a, you know, a laser on an airplane to defend the airplane is interesting, but I'd rather have direct energy that can cover an airfield and so I can protect that airfield and still can be able to generate combat power. And that to me is logistics under attack. Yeah, we're using, we're trying to use all of our exercises to learn something about agile combat employment, about how to do base defense. And so we have aspects and there's direction that comes from, uh, from my headquarters uh, to the wings to say, we want you to try something, you get, and there's a dialogue that goes back and forth between us to have a good understanding of what they tried, what worked, what didn't work. Because uh, I'm willing to experiment. Because you know, I don't think I've, we've gotten all the answers yet, but be able to get some feedback when they do things that we've asked them to do, and then or validate some things we've tried. To go, okay, we tried it several times, and we go, okay, that actually is going to work. And then, how do you put that into our own doctrine and change our approach? Coming up, we'll go inside a Defense News Roundtable discussion focusing on what startups and other venture capital-backed companies can do to work with the Pentagon. On this week's Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack offers her latest tips. It's been said many times that veterans make the best business owners, and it's true. In fact, over 2.5 million small businesses across the nation are owned by veterans. With so many successful veteran business owners, you might wonder how come more veterans don't become entrepreneurs? For many people, not just vets, it's difficult to overcome some of the perceived hurdles. They don't know where to begin or think it's too hard or takes too much money to start up. That's where franchising can come in. It's a great option and can lower many of the risks associated with creating a business from scratch. What makes it even more of a draw for veterans is the skills gained while serving in the military are the same ones that make franchising such a great way to go. As an owner, you're given a playbook on how to run the business. Consider it a tried and true battle plan for success. 
What's more, franchisees get the benefits of a great support system. If you need training, you get it. If you need more help running your business, it's offered to you. Usually there's always a person or a team to back you up. The best part? Companies hunting for franchisees are ready to partner with veterans, and many offer discounts to kickstart your business. To find out more, work with a trusted business advisor at your bank or credit union, or check out their website. Entrepreneurship could be just a click away. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more Defense News coverage, be sure to visit our website at defensenews.com and subscribe to our early bird brief delivered to your inbox every weekday morning to get you ready to start the day. And coming up, we'll go inside a Defense News Roundtable discussion focusing on what startups and other venture capital-backed companies can do to work with the Pentagon. Recently, at a Defense News Organized Roundtable, we discussed the problem of venture capital-backed companies working with the Pentagon. During that event, there was a lot of great discussion. Here's one of the exchanges. Yeah. My question for Mike and Tom, actually, if I can flip it, it's like, so how could you work the venture community best? Like, what's your, what does success look like for DIU, for the DOD? What does that public-private partnership look like? Well, I think we, um, you know, Tom leads a, the commercial engagement team, like I said, and so I, I think working with the venture community on what they're seeing, uh, emerging technology, um, what they're investing in that we could start working with as well, bringing our, our customer base uh, there, I, th I think is probably a, a great start. Um, I think there needs to be further, further discussion on what would a public-private partnership look like, um, and that gets to, uh, I think, a, an underlying issue with the department is a lack of full understanding of what venture capital even is, how Silicon Valley and, and the tech industry writ large, how they do their funding. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a lack of understanding of you know, the difference between uh, seed round, angel funding, the, the various funding rounds uh, that you talked about earlier, and, and what um, amount of money can impact each one of those rounds. It doesn't have to be huge amounts of money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the later stage when you're looking to transition, that's a different uh, discussion, but uh, there can be uh, smaller amounts can be very, very impactful, and I think a lack of understanding of, of where exactly to apply those in, in the life cycle of that uh, partnership, I think, is one of the things we're definitely going to have to get to. So I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to mediate the chaos in my opinions on, on these things, uh, but, <laughs> but one area where I still have uh, a pretty strong uh, criticism of the DOD, um, I realize that things are really hard. Um, but the suggestion that there isn't an opportunity to build a huge multi-tens of billions of dollar company uh, working with the government is actually crazy. Like, it, there is so much money being allocated to these problems, and it's a source selection problem. We're just not making the right decisions. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the government were making decisions that were based around merit and likelihood that a program is going to be successful, that I think these venture-backed companies would have a, as much of a chance to be successful as Lockheed Martin does to increase their market cap by 5% over the course of a year. Um, it, some examples of this is that, um, you know, I've, I've joked with some of our portfolio companies that um, uh, I, I'm gonna get this tattooed on my neck or something, but US Title 10 Code 2377 is like an entire piece of law about commercial preference, that you're not allowed to build something if it exists, but it's completely ignored. Just like completely ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is like, if you go back and you look at what has happened with Palantir and SpaceX over the last 10 years, they've both sued the government about Title 10, 2377. Um, and I think if we had a cultural shift inside the building where when we looked at whether or not, like how we were going to approach this really hard problem, and we said, first things first, does this exist? And if it exists, um, how can I modify my requirements to make it possible for me to license or acquire this technology um, that would shorten the cycle for developing the capability, would massively reduce the risk of the program, and would bring new entrants into the defense space? But we're just not making that decision. In fact, they're almost doing the opposite, because what you find instead is a customization of requirements um, to basically force force there not to be a, any kind of technology already out there that can be leveraged. Sure, there's, there's definitely some of that going on. The, the other aspect of this that um, hasn't really been talked about very much is that you see all this 
kind of constant critiquing of the Chinese system yeah. where, and you know, I've heard since I landed in LA last night, I've heard no fewer than three or four times the fear of Chinese uh, tech transfer policy, like how they just take the IP for the things that uh, are entering their market through military civil fusion or whatever it is. That criticism is valid, but it also applies to us. Like that's what we ask from commercial companies. We say, yes, we want to, you know, you are the right product for us. Now turn over your source code. It's crazy. Like we're literally doing to our companies in America what we're criticizing the Chinese for doing to their companies and to our companies when we enter that market. Um, and so like there has to be a better commercial practice um, for enabling companies to retain their IP um, and do business with the government um, without having to fight a legal battle every time they go through a contract. That's all we have time for this week. But if you want to see and read more, be sure to head over to defensenews.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too.